Good evening. I'm Anna Savilova. I work in the Eastern Department of the State Hermitage and I'm head of the Far East sector and curator for the collection of Japanese art stored at the museum. Today we would like to talk about some of the Netsuki from our collection, which in total consists of around 700 pieces of different levels and varying quality, including masterpieces and more ordinary pieces. On the third floor of the Winter Palace, you can find our permanent collection with around 140-150 Netsuki on display for you. Today we will give a small presentation of some pieces which we have chosen for our site's project. The subject of the Netsuki I have here is likely hard to understand without being familiar with Japanese literature. If we look at it closely, we can see an old woman with her mouth wide open, almost to her ears. Half of her head is bald, while in the front locks of hair come down to her elbows. Her eyes are under a sunken brow, which is raised in a suffering grimace. She is half naked, with her back exposed and protruding ribs and spine. Her thin arms are wrapped around a wooden plank. This plank is in fact a gravestone, which in Sanskrit is called stupa and in Japanese sotoba. It is a wooden board with a rounded end at the top, bearing a letter of the Sanskrit alphabet, which can hardly be seen here. These boards were placed on graves. As far as the subject of this Netsuki, we have a poet from the 9th century who was very well known at the time, later becoming legendary for her poetic talents. The Japanese, with their love of counting everything, made a list of the six greatest poets, the 36 greatest poets, and she is among the six greatest poets in Japan of all time. However, she wasn't only known for her poetic talent, but for her stunning beauty as well. She was a lady-in-waiting for the imperial court. While hardly any reliable information of her biography has survived, legend tells many stories of how her beauty ruined or subdued many men. One particular story is very didactic. A young man was in love with the poet and tried to have the feelings returned. The young beauty, however, gave him one condition. He was to come to her house every night for a hundred days and remain beside her house no matter the weather. If he passed the test, she would be his. The man was so in love with her that every night he came to her house and stayed until morning in rain and snow, and only on the hundredth night was he not able to come. According to one legend, he died on the way to her. According to another, his father had died and his filial duty prevailed over love. The poet was condemned for her behavior and regretted what she had done. She left the court and went into the mountains and was never seen again. Only rarely would stories be heard in the capital of how she had been seen as a beggarly woman in tattered clothes. The subject of this Netsuki references a play of the No Theatre, which tells the story of how many years after the poet was alive, two monks were walking along a road and came to a cemetery and saw an old woman sitting on a gravestone. They went up to her and told her how disrespectful it was to sit on a grave, to which the old woman answered that it was more important for the living than for the dead, and entered into a religious debate with them. The monks were surprised by how wise, smart, and educated the old woman seemed to be and asked who she was. She then revealed her true form, turning right before their eyes into the young woman with long black hair and beautiful clothing. She told them her story and that she was actually the poet Ono no Komachi, who I've just mentioned. The monks were overcome with respect for her and realized that this was the true meaning of retribution, this Buddhist idea of karma, where any bad deed committed in life will certainly come to an end and bring with it karmic retribution. The old woman who couldn't find peace but had to wander around cities or sat at a grave hugging the headstone 
was serving out her punishment for being so cold-hearted and inattentive to the feelings which were shown to her. Here the poet appears as a ghost or demon. Her appearance is very similar to the mountain witch Yamauba. During the Edo period, ghosts of stories and other similar demonic beings became popular. These were called Kaidan. These scary stories were first told orally among people and later in the 17th century they began to be printed in book form as a collection of stories and were very popular at the time. There was a tradition to gather at night during the hottest time of July to light lanterns and tell each other ghost stories. At the end of each story, one of the lanterns would be put out and this would continue until the last lantern was out. The cold sweat which would appear on the listeners who believed in the truth of the stories was meant to cool them down in the heat. It is possible that this both moral and scary story of the poet became popular due to the love and popularity of Kaidan at the time. At the back of the Netsky, we can clearly see the signature. The signature belongs to the carver Anraku. Anraku lived and worked in Osaka during the first half of the 19th century. If we look at his other work, we can see that he loved to carve predominantly out of ivory and with a light stain. Our Netsky is also from ivory. The brown tone clearly gives this away. In this case, the piece has been completely stained. What led him to do this is hard to say since this approach to completely stain the ivory in a cherry wood color is very unusual for Netsky. The details with an even darker stain can be seen on the hem of the material wrapped around Onono Komachi. Here we see decorative foliage called karakusa, a Chinese grass. This grass was typically applied to expensive brocade fabrics. With this, the carver appears to be hinting at the former status of the old woman as a lady-in-waiting of the imperial court. 